I'd like to welcome you all to our Your Child's Health University lecture this evening. I'm Nancy Sanchez from Community Relations here at Packard Children's, and it's my pleasure each month to introduce our physician uh, specialists who uh, have presentations for families and um, professionals in the community. And you've been given, as you come in the door, a list uh, with this spring's lectures. Uh, do take a look and we welcome you to all of those. And then on the back, there's a list of those that are already in our online library, past lectures. So you can go to lpch.org and you can see some of the lectures from past years. That said, I want you to know that we are, as you can see, recording this lecture as well. So you can review uh, the material later. It usually takes us about two weeks to get it uh, posted on our uh, online library. Also, because we're recording, we ask that you maybe hold your questions to the end so your questions could be kept private and they will stop recording uh, at the end of the presentation. Okay, just so you know, jot them down and then um, uh, we'll have a, a question and answer period for you later. So this evening, as you know, our topic is the neurodevelopment of preterm babies. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Courtney Wustoff to you this evening. She's a new addition to LPCH's child neurology team. She's an assistant professor of neurology at Stanford University and the lead neurologist for the neonatal uh, neurointensive care unit at Packard Children's opening in the spring. She received her BA in neuroscience and neurophysiology uh, and behavior at Columbia University in New York and her MD at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Wustoff completed her pediatrics residency at um, Children's Hospital of Oakland and her neuro and neurophysiology training at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Quite a resume. Uh, more recently, Dr. Wustoff served as consultant in perinatology, perinatal neurology at the Hammersmith Hospital and Imperial College in London. She's now happily returned to the Bay Area and joined us here at Packard Children's, and it's our great pleasure to introduce her to you this evening. Dr. Wooster, thanks for your time. Right. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, it's really exciting to be able to come and talk about this topic because there's a lot that's going on right now here at Packard, uh, especially for looking at neurodevelopment of our babies who are especially vulnerable, especially fragile, and this is a particular passion of mine. So what I'm going to try to cover over the next 45 minutes or so and, and leave us lots of time for questions. I'm going to review patterns of neurodevelopment, both in terms of the physiology, the biology, and also the things that you see at home with your baby. Uh, I'm going to talk about things that are different for babies who have been born early, uh, things that can be especially noticeable for them. And then I'm going to finish off by talking about, well, what are the things that we can do to help foster neurodevelopment for babies who are born preterm? So thinking about patterns of neurodevelopment, what you see here is an MRI scan for a patient who's 27 weeks gestational age. That means the pregnancy lasted for 27 weeks and then the baby was born. And this MRI was done as part of the research at the Hammersmith Hospital, where I was recently. And you can see that for this baby who was born at about six and a half months into the pregnancy, there's this outer layer which is the gray matter. That's where the actual brain cells live, the neurons are. And then in between, there's this darker area, which is the developing white matter. That's like the cables, the wiring between the different cells. It helps link up different parts of the brain. And you can compare that to this MRI scan. This is the same baby when they're four months old, four months corrected age. This still gets me. It's just really amazing in such a short amount of time how much brain development is. There is. The obvious thing is the head size gets much, much bigger. You guys are familiar with that. But also you can see there's so much detail that starts to develop in those early months. Here you have the two halves of the brain, the hemispheres. Those are pretty well separated. You can see there's a little bit of folding in some parts of the brain. 
But by the time baby is four months old, there's a really rich, intricate cortical folding. And that's how the brain is developing. Even after the size stops getting bigger and bigger, brain development continues. The other things you can see on this picture is you start to see these tracks, these pathways that are developing in the brain. They're not really well formed in babies who are, who are preterm, but by a few months, they've started to develop. I should say on these MRI scans, for people who aren't used to looking at MRI scans, uh, you're looking almost like you're looking through the baby's head. So the, the ears would be out at the side. Uh, that's actually the spinal cord coming down through there. That's the top of the head. This is another view of a preterm baby's brain. So this is a different baby. This is at 25 weeks, a baby who the pregnancy lasted just six months before baby was born. And this is a different view looking through the top of the baby's head. So this is the back of the baby's head laying down inside the MRI scanner. The nose would be up here and the eyes up here. And what you can see is, again, the two halves of the brain are pretty well developed. But even using an MRI scan, we can actually see, you can see these stripes, that sort of ribbon pattern. Those are actually layers of nerves, of neurons that are going out to where they want to be ultimately in development. So lots of the neurons that will eventually work their way to the outer surface of the brain or the cortex. Cortex actually means bark. Uh, they're still inside the brain and they're finding their way out to the right place. And this is just another level further down in the brain. Again, back of the head, the front of the head up there. You can see there's a little bit of folding. There's these normal pockets of fluid inside the brain. And you can see just, if you look real hard, that there's these ribbons of, of neurons that are migrating out to the place that they need to be. Now, in a term infant, this is not the same baby, but uh, similar views. Just a few weeks later, same position, back of the head, front of the head, huge difference in how much the brain's developed. You have much more detailed folding of the brain on the outside. The cortex is really starting to get wrinkled. Uh, you, have, you don't see the same ribbons that you see up here because all of the neurons have gone out to where they need to be. But you do start to see changes in the white matter as the different pathways are developing. And in this image, you can see again, compared to up here, where there's just a little bit of folding in, much more detailed folding, much more intricate. There's a lot that's going on in those weeks. You have the movement of the neurons of the brain cells out to the locations where they need to go. You have development of those white matter tracks or white matter pathways. And they develop in a predictable fashion. We know what to expect of babies of different ages. We know that, for example, the folding should be at a certain point at certain ages. We know that the brain, the white matter connections, they get myelinated or insulated from the back first and then towards the front. So all the parts of the brain that have to do with sensation, like vision, those develop first. And then the parts that have to do with more complicated things, like paying attention and following directions, those develop last. So there's a lot that's going on in those early weeks and months. And the way that that's reflected at the pediatrician's visits is in head growth. So lots of people have seen this before. This is the CDC's chart for how head circumference should change over the first months. So if you look down here, this is at birth, six months, 12 months. And then up here is how big the head should be around in terms of centimeters or inches, depending on what you prefer. And what you can see on this curve is there's a huge amount of head growth that happens in that first year or so. And then it starts to slow down. And that's really reflecting what's happening with the brain inside, that most of the brain development's happening in these early months. By three to five years, most brain development has happened. And then after five years, there's some fine tuning. And that's how we get to hopefully where we are as adults. Uh, Head size is largely driven by brain growth in babies. And that's one of the reasons that the pediatrician keeps checking it, is because if the head's growing well, then that's really reassuring that the brain's growing well. But if there's any differences in head growth, you have to take a closer look to try to understand, is there something different about the way the brain's growing? Uh, most children, by the time they're age five, their head circumference is going to be about 90% of what it's going to be as adults. So really, that's a lot of brain growth, a lot of head growth happening in the first years. 
This picture is a little bit complicated, but I love it because it's got so much illustration on it. So this is from a study uh, that Olga Capellu did uh, a few years ago, where they studied a bunch of babies, volunteers in the nursery, preterm babies. The families agreed to let them have MRI scans done so that the researchers could get a better idea of how exactly the brain's developing over time. So down here, this is the gestational age in weeks, how old the baby was at the time that the pictures are. They did this in many different babies. The pictures are obviously just taken from one particular example. So some things you can see are just the brain size at 26 weeks. It's much smaller than once you get out to that term equivalent age of 40 weeks. You can see that the degree of folding gradually increases uh, each point along the, the trajectory. So even a difference of one or two weeks changes what you expect to see on an MRI scan or an ultrasound scan. And then the more subtle things that we see are some of the pathways that start to develop in the white matter as babies get older. These charts up here, they're showing how brain growth is changing over that same period of time. So in the beginning, at about 26 weeks, you have this is brain volume, meaning like how big overall the brain is. And this is brain surface area, the amount that that cover, the cortex is. And brain volume gets bigger and bigger from 26 weeks up until about term. But even more than that, it's the folding that really takes off, that really skyrockets in those last months and weeks of pregnancy. And again, that reflects that the head can only get so big, while, especially while baby's growing inside of mom. But the brain keeps developing because the surface of the brain becomes more and more intricately folded and well-developed. And this is another study that followed on that that just confirmed what was suspected, that if you take a look at babies' head circumferences, the size around their head, that that matches up really well with how big their brain is. When you do the MRI scan and you do all the calculations to figure out what the volume of the baby's brain is. So the head size is a really good reflection of how the brain is growing on the inside. So that's how the structure of the brain changes over the first weeks and then months in a baby, either before or after they're born. Other things that are evolving at the same time are the function of the brain. So I always describe it as you know, if the, the structure of the brain or the parts all being in the right place and getting connected in the right way. The function is how it's actually working. You may look at your computer and it looks like all the parts are in the right way, but that doesn't necessarily tell you that everything is working in the way that you would expect. So there's two ways that we've studied and tried to understand how brain function changes uh, in newborns. One way and a way that I'm particularly interested in is EEG or electroencephalography. And this is a picture of a baby having an EEG done. These little electrodes are just like the stickers you get on your chest if you have an EKG done for your heart, but we put them on the head. They work in the same way. An EKG is looking to see the difference in electricity in different parts of the, the chest. The EEG is looking to see electrical differences in different parts of the head caused by brain activity, by brain function. There's different ways of doing EEG. A newer way is amplitude integrated EEG or AEEG. And some of the people from the NICU may have seen this. Uh, it's something that we're using more and more in our own nursery. When you don't need the information from all 20 of the stickers all around the head, sometimes we'll just use three, sometimes just five stickers to get an idea of what's happening overall in this baby's brain. And if there's a reason to look in more detail, then we'll use the rest of the electrodes. So this is what the actual information we get looks like. So this is an EEG from a baby who's 27 weeks gestation. Uh, at this early age, this is what we would expect to see. You have this whole screen would be about 20 seconds worth of time. And so you can have up to 10 seconds at a time where there's not a lot of brain activity that you can measure on the surface using your EEG. And then you'll get a little burst of brain waves that'll last for maybe a second or two, and then things will be quiet again. And that's just how the brain's working at that early age. By the time you get up to 40 weeks or term, 
things are much more active. Now you've got activity every single second within any period that you're looking, whether the baby's awake, whether the baby's asleep. It's changing within a second, from second to second. Uh, there's always something going on. It's different in different parts of the brain. It's not a sort of quiet pauses that you see in an, a preterm baby. So just as the structure of the brain is, is developing over those first few weeks, the function of the brain is evolving as well. And then we take that sort of information and we process it in different ways and you can compare it in different ways. And you start to really get patterns for what to expect in terms of brain development. So this is a graph, if anybody is an engineer out there, looking at the voltage or the amplitude of the electrical signal in the brain waves. And then looking at, well, over an hour, how does that change? And in a preterm baby, it's all over the place. Sometimes it's five microvolts, sometimes it's up at 50. But by the time a baby gets to 55 weeks or a few months after term age, things are a little bit neater, they're a little bit more consistent. You have more uh, normal patterns changing whether the baby's awake or asleep. And we can do lots of different analysis like this, especially using some of the newer equipment to try to not just look at pictures of how the brain is developing, but actually measuring how it's functioning. So that's all good and well. That's sort of medically and biologically how we think about brain development. But neurodevelopment is bigger than that. And more importantly is what do you see when you're looking at the baby as the baby's getting older, uh, both in the nursery and later. So there's lots of different ways to break down neurodevelopment. People categorize it in different ways. I'm going to talk about one system, certainly not the only system, uh, but it's just one that, that I like. So there's motor skills. This is one of the first things that you can look at to see how a baby's neurodevelopment's coming along. We talk about gross motor skills. For example, holding the head up by about two months age, a baby should be able to lift their head up for a little bit at a time. Rolling over by about four or five months, babies will start doing that. Lots of babies start sitting by the time they're six months and then taking those first steps maybe with a little bit of help by the time they're a year old. There's also the fine motor skills. Gross motor skills are the big movements. Fine motor skills are the more delicate, more precise movements. So that's things like holding an object when it's placed in the baby's hand. Bringing the hands to the mouth is a great milestone because now the baby has a way to experience things in a whole new way. Uh, and the pincer grasp, people hear that. That's uh, when you can use your thumb and your finger to pick up an object rather than just grabbing it with your whole hand. Another domain or another area of neurodevelopment is language and communication. So those are a little bit different, and I try to make those distinctions because there are some children who have difficulty with either communication or one aspect of language but are really doing quite well in other areas. So communication starts before the baby's using words. That's the noises the baby makes, whether the baby listens when somebody's talking, seems to respond to music or sounds. Uh, making eye contact, looking towards mom or dad when they say the baby's name or when mom or dad are talking, and eventually ending up with first words. After that, language starts to develop, receptive language, understanding the language that's spoken. You tell the baby to go get a book, understanding what that means and, and being able to follow that direction. And that's different than expressive language, which is being able to use the words that the baby wants to use. Another area or domain of neurodevelopment is social and personal skills. Sometimes people will say personal and emotional skills. Uh, these are skills that have to do with how the baby functions in, in their own environment. So part of that is social development. Recognizing parents uh, particularly is different than other adults. That happens in the first few months where baby smiles at mom or dad but isn't quite so sure about doctor when I come in the room. Smiling, that's very early in the first few weeks for a lot of babies, being able to smile back when somebody smiles at baby. Laughing, play, by about six to nine months, you get that really nice play of peekaboo or, or repeating things in a sort of interaction. Uh, personal skills, what's meant by that is things like uh, looking in a mirror and recognizing yourself. Uh, 
helping with things like putting on clothes, reaching for shoes, and trying to feed yourself. Another area or domain of, of development is perception. So this is a little tricky. Sensation is the five senses, hearing, touch, smell, taste, vision. Perception is understanding all of the information that comes in. So sensory development is largely just how well are the eyes working, how well are the ears working. But then it's more complicated than that when the brain has to put together all of that information. So initially, babies have great senses of smell. They can recognize mom's breast milk as compared to other kinds of breast milk, even when they're only a few days old. They understand their world largely from touch and from taste. That's why everything goes right into the mouth. Uh, hearing and vision start to come along shortly after. A baby whose term age, when they're held in mom's arms, is able to see about as far as from mom's arms to the face or mom's arms to the breast. Uh, as the baby gets older, they're able to see a little bit further and make out a little more detail. Perception is understanding the things you see. So visual processing, for example, is it's taking that, that extra step from I see this blob and it's circle shaped and it looks familiar to recognizing that's mom's face. Uh, understanding that the sounds that the baby's hearing have a pattern to them and then taking that next step to recognizing it as language. And then the really complicated stuff comes in a few years later with visuospatial skills, recognizing a pattern that's a shape and then identifying that as a letter, for example. And then things that start very early on but maybe aren't as often recognized and become much more important later are, are attention and behavior skills. So attention starts out early. Visual attention is actually one of the most sensitive indicators of babies who are doing, gonna do really well later on. So babies who've had a rocky start, when you take a look at how well they're able to pay attention to a picture or to a face that's in front of them, if they're able to do that well when they're at a term age, then those babies almost always go on to do very well without any problems. And that's just the earliest form of attention, being interested in stimuli around them and being able to concentrate on one thing at a time. It sounds silly to think about babies concentrating, but you can actually see it, that they'll look at a face, they'll stay looking at that face, they'll follow it when it starts to move in different directions. As children get older, that gets more complicated. It's self-regulation, learning how to calm down when you're angry or learning how to express yourself if you're sad or frustrated. An executive function is things like making plans for what you wanna do or holding things in your memory and then using that information. So that's a quick overview of neurodevelopment, a little bit of the biology behind it, a little bit of the things that you see. Uh, and I'm gonna talk now about, well, what things do we know about preterm babies and their neurodevelopment? So I, I should say here that when I talk about age for the rest of the talk, uh, there's chronologic age, which is just how long has it been since you were born? If you were born three days ago, you're three days old. There's conceptional age, like I've been using so far, and that's the date from conception. So if uh, pregnancy lasted for 24 weeks and then a baby has, was born in three weeks ago, then 24 plus three is 27 weeks conceptional age. We use that a lot in the NICU. Corrected age is when you correct up for when a baby's due date was. So if a baby was due in December and now it's January, that baby's corrected age is one month, even if they were born early. Everybody's a little bit different, but most of the time, corrected age is used when you're talking about development until a baby's about two years old. It's a little arbitrary. Uh, some people will use three years, some people will use a year and a half. Most people correct up until about two years. You can't correct forever. We obviously don't talk about people being 34 years corrected age. Um, but the catch about this, and something that's actually really commonly worrying for parents and, and for some physicians, is that you can seem to have great development up until age two, and then you stop correcting. And suddenly it looks like there's this huge drop off in development. And it's actually just that you've stopped sort of grading on that curve, and now you're using a, a more strict standard for the baby's development. Um, again, it's arbitrary, but that's the age that most people use. 
So we're learning more and more about how the brain structure actually develops in preterm babies. This is an MRI scan from a baby who was born at 29 weeks and is now 40 weeks conceptional age or term equivalent age. They're at their due date. And this is a baby who was just born at their due date. So these babies are at the same point in time, but you can see that their brains look different. I think the most obvious thing that people see is the difference in the head shape. That's really common in babies who are born preterm, that in the beginning, before they're able to sit up and move around as much, that they might have a longer, more oval shape to the head uh, than term babies who might have a more round circle shape to the head. That gets a little bit better as they get older. Uh, as they're laying on their back more, it helps shape the head but it can persist to a degree, and then they grow up and have hair, and, and you don't notice it as much. But there's more that's different in this brain if you look a little bit closer. So one thing I'll point out is that if you look again at this outside surface of the brain, the cortex, that outer layer, and you compare the amount of folding in the baby who was born early to the baby who was born on their due date, there's just a little bit more folding here. It's not the sort of thing that you would necessarily jump, at, jump out at you in the picture, but, but once you start to compare and you compare dozens of babies and hundreds of babies, it's a pattern that we see that sometimes for babies who are born early, it takes them a little bit longer to have that degree of folding that you would expect. For most babies, this catches up by the time they're two or three years old, but it is a difference just in the way that the brain's built in those early weeks and months. The other difference, which I think is much more subtle, is that the white matter, which is this part here, is brighter in babies who have been born preterm as compared to babies who are born at their due date. And that reflects that that white matter, the connections in between different parts of the brain, it's just a little bit immature. It hasn't quite uh, developed the same degree of connection. It hasn't evolved in the same way as the baby who was born on their due date. And this is something that more and more people are recognizing as important, because the degree of immaturity in the white matter is very useful in trying to understand what to expect for the future. And I'll talk more about that in a second. Now, some babies who are born preterm, unfortunately, have extra risk factors for having neurodevelopmental difficulties. This is a picture of an MRI scan from a baby who had a, a bleed inside of the brain, uh, an intraventricular hemorrhage that affected actually part of the brain tissue. And so babies who are born extremely early, 24, 25 weeks, we know that they're at a higher risk for having neurodevelopmental problems later on. And we watch after them extra, extra closely. Babies who are very low birth weight, who are under 500 grams when they're first born, we know that they're at a higher risk for having neurodevelopmental problems later. And then babies who have complications in those first weeks, if they have infections of the brain or meningitis early on, if there's bleeding in the brain from any cause, uh, and a condition called periventricular leukomalacia, which affects fortunately many fewer babies than it used to, um, but is also seen in preterm babies and can cause injury to the developing brain, which might make neurodevelopment more difficult later on. So one of the things that we do in the nursery is we look to see are there any early warning signs that any of these things might be going on in a baby. And again, because I like EEG, I like looking at the brain waves. That's something I'm particularly interested in. And if you think back to that picture of the nice, pretty, tight brain wave pattern in the baby who was born uh, on their due date. This is an example of what a brainwave pattern might look like in a baby who has brain injury. And this is before you can see the brain injury if you take a picture, but you get some early warning signs in the way that the brain is functioning, the way that the electrical signals are being transmitted. So that's one thing that we can look for is we try to understand among the babies who are born early, which ones might be at higher risk. So this is the part where I always stop and try to remind everyone that most babies who are born preterm go on to lead lives without neurodisability. And I think that's really important because as physicians, our job is to worry about the worst case scenario. We always want to make sure that we're watching out for anything that we can prevent and anything we can protect against. Uh, and sometimes we don't do justice to the majority of babies who are born preterm who go on to do very well. 
So I'll go through now. We talked before about some of those areas of development. I'm going to talk about those areas of development again and talk about what are the things that are just a little bit different in preterm babies. And for these next few slides, I'm talking about babies who uh, don't have particular complications during their NICU stay, but just preterm babies all overall. What do we see? So this picture is a baby who was born at 29 weeks, who's now at their due date, who's now at term equivalent age. And this is a picture of a baby who was born on his due date. And you can see a difference just in their posture and their tone. This is an older picture. Fortunately, you won't see this in our NICUs anymore. But this is what it might look like for a baby who's left in a cot or a crib for those first months after being born early. They have a posture from instead of being curled up inside of mom's uterus, they get a posture where the back is straighter, where the shoulders are drawn back a little bit. They don't have the same tightness in their posture and tone. And that can persist for up to a year. It's really common when I see a baby who's been born early, and they're now six months, nine months, a year old, and you start to see how their muscle tone is and how their joints are, that they might be a little bit loose, that they're not quite as high in their tone. Usually it's subtle, but if you look for it, it's there. What does that mean? Well, most babies catch up by the time, again, that they're two or three years old. But it can mean that some of the things that require that extra curved up posture, like sitting, for example, might come a little bit late, even after you correct for gestational age or correct for prematurity. Uh, because some preterm babies will have that tendency to hold their backs straight, their trunks straight, you can have a tendency to keep going backwards. And some parents will describe it as a rocketing backwards, especially when baby's angry or crying or fussing. And I've had a couple of parents who, uh, it's just so sad, they'll, they'll see this when baby's upset and think that baby's trying to get away from them. It's not that at all. It's that if you have a normal tendency to hold your back straight, and then you get upset, and that's more and more exaggerated, then babies will sometimes push themselves backwards. The shoulders being back, as compared to a baby who's born on time, means that some babies need a little more encouragement to reach for objects. You can imagine if your shoulders are back more, that it's going to be a little bit more effort to reach out for something that's in front of you, as compared to if your hands are always in front of you. Uh, that's something that a lot of our uh, therapies help try to encourage. And so even in the NICU, before a baby goes home, now there's a real focus on developmental care, about getting physical therapy input for how can we promote good motor development in those early days and weeks so that things are as completely optimal as they can be when baby goes home. Some differences in behavior. So definitely sleep-wake cycles are disrupted in the nursery. As much as we try, there's lights, there's noises, there's alarms, nursing, doctors. And it's hard enough to try to get babies into a regular sleep-wake cycle in those first weeks and months. And for preterm babies, it's harder. And that can last for the first three to four months. It's hard. There's not, unfortunately, a magic cure for it. But I think the most important thing to know is that it's not a sign that the baby has a brain injury. It's not a sign that there's something wrong with your baby's development. It's something that we know happens with preterm babies. And, and it doesn't mean that there's anything more ominous underneath. The same is true for crying, uh, especially if you have a baby who's just been very sick for the first weeks or months and hasn't really had that opportunity to express themselves as much. They go home, things are different, they're ready to express themselves, and there can be lots of crying and crying for no apparent reason. And again, this is really common in babies who are born early and have no brain problems, whose neurodevelopment goes on to be completely normal. But especially when you're first coming home after you've been through so much in the nursery. It's understandable that a lot of parents are worried about that. A question I get asked a lot about are what's the risk of ADHD? What's the risk of autism after preterm birth? I think we're starting to understand more about that. Um, there's conflicting evidence about attention problems. There's some studies where babies who are born earlier have higher incidences of problems like ADHD. And then there's other research studies where they say, no, that's not true. 
Uh, the same is true for autism. There's some studies where babies who are born, particularly babies who are born very early, uh, have a higher rate of autism than babies who are born on their due date. But then there's other researchers who say that it's the same in both, both groups. So that's an area where we need to learn more, where we need to do more research. Coordination. So uh, just like the brain development takes a little bit longer, needs to catch up. Coordination skills can often be a little rough, especially in the first months or years. This is usually described as, you know, he's just clumsy. I hear that a lot. Um, a lot of that can have to do with visuospatial perception. So uh, understanding where objects are in space and trying to control the way that your body is moving towards them is a lot more complicated than we recognize as we're doing it. We take that for granted. Um, but for a baby who's been born preterm, they have to work at it a little bit harder. Um, the way that this might come out is much later on, for example, having bad handwriting, uh, being reluctant to participate in sports because they've got this label of clumsy. Practice does help. Uh, occupational therapy can help if it's enough, if it's significant enough that it's interfering with regular activities. And for sports, the most important thing is to help kids find something that they enjoy and to really emphasize that it's fun to go out and play and to do games rather than performance and, and always being number one in, in classroom sports. So that's a, a sort of, again, an overview of for the different domains of development. What are some of the things that can be different for preterm babies? And what are some of the things that families notice? Again, most babies who are born preterm go on to have no neurodisability. Lots of babies who are born preterm will have to work a little bit harder in the beginning and may have some differences, especially in those early months and years. But the, the reason that I love my job, that I love being a neonatal neurologist, is that there's so much that's changing in those first five years in the way that the brain is growing and developing. We have tons of opportunities to help change things as the brain's growing. Uh, babies' brains are just amazing, the kinds of things that they recover from and cope with compared to adults where, unfortunately, most of your brain development's finished by the time that you're 16. All right, so for the last few minutes, what I'm going to talk about are how can we help neurodevelopment of babies who are born preterm? So I think the first thing is that brain care starts in the nursery, starts in the NICU. And there's lots of different evidence about this. This slide is uh, from a paper that just came out very recently, just in the last month. And what these researchers did is they processed the MRI images, like you saw in the first slides. And the colors indicate different measures of how the volume is and how well developed that part of the brain is. And they compared babies who were born preterm who had poor growth. They just weren't gaining weight. They weren't getting bigger. To babies who had normal growth, expected growth. And they found that the brain development was better in the babies who had good growth after being born preterm. So there's lots of reasons to make sure that you take care of things like nutrition in the NICU, and brain development is just one more. It's not just about getting up to a certain number for weight. It's about really giving the body what it needs to form those connections and have that neurodevelopment going on. I think one thing that we're really lucky to have here are fantastic NICU nurses. And as we open up our neurology NICU uh, this spring, we're training people to recognize what are the early signs that this baby might be at an especially high risk for neurodevelopmental problems. How can we pick up on those signs before injury is, is already done? And what can we do differently to try to ameliorate that? One of the tools that we use is brain monitoring. Uh, and that's something that we're extending now in our nursery to babies who are born in those risk groups, babies who are born especially early, uh, babies who are very extremely low birth weight when they're born, babies who have infections, or where you know that there's been stroke or other brain injury. Two of the types of brain monitoring that we use, so this is EEG again. Uh, we're now using more and more EEG that you leave those electrodes on, maybe overnight, maybe for a couple of days. And you look to see how is the brain function happening, not just at this 20 seconds where I'm looking at the screen, but over the day, over the night. Is the baby having normal brain activity when they're falling asleep, when they're waking up? Are they responding normally, their brain waves, to being touched, to being held? 
Uh, another tool that we're introducing that we're going to be using more and more is something called NEARS, Near Infrared Spectroscopy. So what this is, is a tool, it's actually a quite small sensor that goes on the baby's forehead. And it turns out that if you use infrared light that goes down just less than a centimeter into the surface of the brain, different uh, oxygen levels in the blood will change the way that that light gets absorbed. And so if you have normal oxygen levels in your blood, the light's going to get absorbed differently than if you don't have enough oxygen in your blood. It's the same principle as the, the pulse oximeter, the monitor that goes on your finger that tells you what the oxygen level is in somebody where you're worried about their lungs, for example. But this is actually telling us real time what the information is about how is blood flow coming to this baby's brain? Are they getting enough oxygen to that tissue? Uh, in babies, for example, who have heart or lung problems, is this, is this affecting the way that their brain is getting oxygen? Right now, an emphasis that we have uh, in many NICUs is developmental care. So there's lots of medical stuff that we focus on, the infections, the cardiac care, the pulmonary care. But encompassing all of that, how can we help promote the baby's development during the time that they're in the NICU? So that's modifying the physical environment, trying to reduce stress. Do we really need to do that extra blood draw, or could we maybe wait and get that test the next time that we have to get a blood sample? Regulating light and sound, making sure that baby gets a break, gets some quiet time during the day. It's about the baby's immediate environment, not just the, the NICU, but where the baby is in space, helping support the baby's position. You'll see a lot of swaddling and a lot of the rolls under the baby to help mimic that curled up position of the baby who's born at their due date so that they don't get into that habit of having the extensor, extensor posturing. Skin to skin care or kangaroo care, there's lots of evidence that this is really important for baby's development. Having that touch, that contact with their parents, it's very soothing. Uh, they have better heart rates, better uh, brainwave patterns. All of these things are improved with skin-to-skin -skin or kangaroo care. And then recognizing cues. Uh, our developmental specialists and our nurses are fantastic at saying, Doc, I know you want to examine the baby, but he just fell asleep, and you're going to have to come back an hour later. And that's great. That's what I need. I need someone to point out those cues to me to let the baby have some sort of normal sleep-wake cycle so that things are easier when you go home. Recognizing that right now the baby's calm, and so that might be a good time to play and to see how the vision is, and not trying to examine a baby when they're already stressed and upset. For parents, I get asked a lot, well, what can we do at home to help help with our baby's neurodevelopment. I think overall the sort of blanket statements that would apply to every baby is that the interaction between the family and the baby is the most important thing of all. And that's something you're already doing it, whether you're thinking about it or not. The quality of that interaction is so important. Um, I think that in terms of specific interventions, there's a few things that we know definitely help, and I'll touch on those. There's some things where we don't know yet. Maybe they help, but we don't have proof. And then there's a few things where there's pretty good evidence that uh, it's not going to work out. In the real world, for all of us, you only have so many hours in the day. You only have so much energy in the day. And so you really want to focus those efforts on, well, what does my baby need help with? And what are the things that are most likely to help with my baby's development? So part of what I do in the NICU is I examine babies, I look at their MRI scans, I look at their EEG tests, and I help understand what particular risks there might be and where a baby might need extra help. It's, uh, it's not about trying to look into a crystal ball, it's about saying, well, I know that from what we know about this type of brain condition that these babies might be at extra risk in their motor development. Or we know that these babies might need extra help with their visual, visual development. And that way you can really focus your therapies and your interventions on the things that are going to matter most. Um, every baby has their own temperament. It's really hard when you're trying to make sure your baby's doing well to separate out, well, maybe my baby's just a quiet baby. Maybe my baby's a fussy baby, and it has nothing to do with being preterm. I think that's, that's a challenge that's really hard for parents. Um, some babies do have additional medical concerns you have to take into account. Maybe baby's going home on oxygen. Maybe there's other medical equipment that you have to accommodate in promoting development. 
This is what our high risk infant follow up program is especially good at. Whether that's done here, it's done locally at a lot of different hospitals uh, across California and across the country. It's a chance for families to come check in a few months after you've gone home from the hospital to see how things are coming along and to take into account all of these factors to know, well, what can we do best for this child to help their development? In the meantime, there's tons of checklists of milestones to help watch in general for a child's development. Um, I like the CDC checklists in particular. If you just Google CDC preterm development, these will come up. Uh, and lots of doctor's offices give these out as well. Especially for first time parents, it's a nice way to check in, make sure things are progressing. If you have worries, compare to what other babies might be expected to do at that age. So I said I'd mention, well, what are some of the things that we know help with development? I mentioned skin-to-skin -skin contact. There's lots of reasons that's helpful. So even though it's intimidating in the early days in the NICU to hold your baby when they're so small, we know that it's helpful. Uh, it's great for mom and dad. It's great for baby. We really promote that. Breastfeeding is really important as much as possible to get breast milk to your child. Reading is huge. Reading is associated, the more you read to your baby, there's lots of things that are better later on. Not just language development, but attention span, concentration, behavior, lots of, uh, lots of skills. And then in preterm follow-up programs, it has been shown that where there's a preterm follow-up program, overall babies do better. There is a reason that we drag people back after a couple of months to check in. In terms of motor skills, if motor skills are a particular concern, then some of the important things to look out for are making sure that baby has a little bit of tummy time every day. Lots of preterm babies really don't like this. Uh, but it's important because even if he doesn't like it, the only way that he's going to learn to hold his head up is having that experience of spending time laying down on the tummy. Some babies skip crawling. That's OK. That's really common, especially in babies who've been born preterm. Uh, so that's not emphasized as much as some of the other milestones. I get asked a lot about walkers. It turns out that those don't speed up walking development. And there's some suggestion that it might slow it down, because instead of, sorry, instead of getting the practice of walking along, uh, the baby is practicing putting all of his weight down on the walker. For toddlers, I think that's the most difficult group, because they're not going to do what you ask them to do. Uh, they choose the activities. Is that working? Okay. They choose the activities from the options that you provide, just like with everything for a toddler. They may not eat what you want them to eat, but if you give them a few choices, they're going to have to choose something. For sensation and perception, I think visual development, the key points to remember are that uh, babies first see best in black and white and in solid colors. So the baby blankets and the toys that have a million colors and the glitter and the flashing lights, they're really pretty, but actually are much harder to recognize visually. So in those first few weeks and months, it's easier for a baby to practice their visual development if you use simple pictures or images like sharp contrast between black and white or one solid color or faces. Uh, again, a baby who's at their due date should be able to take a look at mom's face when held in her arms. And that's a warning sign if that's not something that's happening, if babies doesn't seem able to focus. Another thing that you can do to help promote vision, again, it all goes back to reading. Even before baby understands the word, sharing those picture books, getting in the habit of looking at something and trying to understand it. For sounds, Letting baby see your face when you're talking gives them practice understanding the facial movements that go along with speech and practicing making sounds. Talking with a baby is really important for their language development, not just talking at them. That helps a little in hearing speech, but interacting with them. If they point to a ball. Yes, that's a ball. That's a red ball. Repeating, giving feedback on the words that they use. Uh, attention and concentration, a lot of parents ask about TV time. So the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends no screen time in the first two years. This is hard, uh, but that's the recommendation. So no computers, video games, television. And then after that, only 30 minutes a day for the first few years after two years. 
The most important thing for TV is actually the quality of the interaction that goes around TV. So just like you expect children who watch a lot of TV and that's the only stimulation that they get, they're going to have a rough time trying to have development as compared to babies who sit with their parents and watch TV together and you talk about what's happening on the screen. Um, it's the interaction, again, that interaction between the family and the baby that's most important. And then the last thing uh, for attention span, there's a lot to be said for helping practice development of attention span. So it, we all want our babies to do well. You spoil them. You give them all the toys that you can because you want them to have fun and enjoy it. But actually having one object at a time and practicing focusing on that without any distractions, that helps build up the attention span. And then preschool can be particularly useful for babies who are at risk for having learning problems for lots of different conditions. Um, it's quality preschool that's the key factor. And First Five California, again, if you Google First Five California, is an organization that's committed to helping people find quality preschool. They have great checklists for what do I look for when I'm visiting a preschool? What are the kinds of things that are appropriate for children of different ages? And so these are some nice additional resources. Again, first five, focusing on the first five years of any child's life, not just for preterm babies. Uh, March of Dimes is a nonprofit organization that helps uh, with babies who are critically ill when they're first born. They have some lovely information on their website about what to expect when a baby's in the NICU, what to expect after you go home, what are the kinds of things that you need to look for, and the kinds of interventions that are useful after being born early. And then specific to children who do have neurodevelopmental disabilities, My Child Without Limits is a great site that has a host of information about different conditions. Uh, and it's put together largely by parents and by families with some medical input uh, for how to help, again, make the most of, of every day. So I'm almost within time. I'll stop there for any questions.